with all of the amazing advancements that are happening today with technology and the rapid pace that we're, at which we're seeing advancements in genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, nanotechnology, how are we as followers of Jesus Christ to navigate these waters? How does it all fit in with the biblical worldview and with what the Word of God says? We're going to talk about some of that in this coming session. Welcome back to Your Greatest Race. We're now in session eight of the Biblical Foundation for Spiritual Warfare, and uh, we're glad that you're here. We're really enjoying this series and hope that you are as well. We'd love for you to like and subscribe to the video and to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you're able to receive new content as we come out with new material about this and other topics. As in the last session, we started to touch on the technology and the movements in um, in our modern world that are advancing so quickly that it's really hard to keep up for a lot of us. And looking at it through the lens of the spiritual realm, as well as through the, the eyes of spiritual warfare, and to look at it in light of this ancient cosmic battle between good and evil, between Satan and his forces and the kingdom of light in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and, and helping to kind of look at how we as followers of Christ need to look at this and how to be prepared for the coming battles. And so where we left off this last time, we were talking about uh, the second in the GRIN technologies. We talked a little bit before about genetic um, engineering. And now I just I want to talk a little bit more about this, the robotics and the artificial intelligence and the quantum computing. As we were talking about it, it, it is happening so fast that it's really difficult to keep up. You know, we're seeing that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is able to progress and outstrip the capabilities of, of humans very, very rapidly. We've seen, you know, historic um, developments in artificial intelligence where just in a very short period of time, AI was able to, to beat the best player, human player in the world in an ancient Chinese game called Go, as well as, you know, obviously in chess, it way outstripped the fastest, best human chess player. We're seeing advancements in artificial intelligence moving toward um, incredible abilities in uh, voice, voice recognition, facial recognition, uh, driverless cars, pattern recognition. We're seeing it move and change in the medical industry to be able to recognize uh, almost flawlessly looking at CT scans and, you know, lung cancers, detecting different things that radiologists and human eyes often miss. We're seeing just a rapid advancements in robotics and changes that are taking place at a dizzying pace. We talked before about you know how uh, in some of the aspects of artificial intelligence, we don't even know how it learns. We basically set up some parameters, let it go, and, and we have what's happening is the software is writing software, which is writing software and improving and improving upon itself so rapidly at, at a level that we can't even comprehend now, much less as quantum computing comes on the scene even more, it's already on the scene, but as it comes on uh, more fully. The, the question is, you know, will we lose control of this? Will we still be able to, um, you know, to, to have some sort of control on it? You know, we, <laughs> I just think about all of the movies that we see from Hollywood of self-aware, you know, computer robotics uh, combinations, and it usually doesn't go well for humans. And so, you know, to be aware of this, we've got the Internet of Things being rolled out very, very rapidly where everything is connected. We've got satellites that are being sent up into space that are all interconnected to be able to have high-speed 5G um, connectivity anywhere in the world all the time at incredible, incredible speeds. Everything and everyone connected. And so, you know, I certainly, you know, am not one to say that I, I reject it so much that I don't have a cell phone because I do, and I, or I don't use the internet because I do. But, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, where it's going and how it can be used by the enemy because we're already seeing it being used in a lot of cases for nefarious purposes. We talked last time about some of the, the uh, basically abuses in the food system and in the... Uh, you know, with corporations that are poisoning us in a lot of ways that with, with pesticides and toxic uh, foods and things like that, that, um, 
you know, have negative consequences on humanity. We all know that technology can be hacked. We've seen recent examples, very high profile recent examples with the MTA, the Transportation Authority up there in, in, uh, in New York City. We've seen the Colonial Pipeline computer systems, you know, get, get uh, hacked and basically shut down the oil pipeline to the eastern part of the United States for a time. We've, we've seen um, the JBS meat packing plant and, and one of the largest meat packing uh, distributors to be able to, to be hacked and, and have that whole process of our food supply shut down. <clears throat> so with everything and everyone connected, we, we know that these things can be hacked. We know that, that the technology is not just um, independent, that there are people that have um, questionable ethics that can be behind these and, and entities and forces that can manipulate this technology for our harm. And this is controversial, but I'll just say also that I believe that the supernatural demonic realm can also flow through technology. I've seen it in my own life. I'll just tell you a quick story about this. And these are simple things. I don't want to get too far into it, but just to understand that not only do we have human beings with an evil agenda that can be used by Satan and his demonic realm to program in things or to use technology in a harmful way against believers, against followers of Christ, against anyone that they basically decide that they want to go after. But even the demonic realm, even the supernatural spiritual realm can flow through technology. I'll, I'll just give you the example of, of a, a time when I was at my home and uh, my wife and I make a, a point to not ever watch. You know, we're very, very careful with what we watch. And um, we don't watch horror movies and, you know, evil movies that glorify the demonic and the, the evil realm. But we had a, a family member that had um, watched some of these things that was showing up on our uh, Amazon feed. And so I was curious one day as to what was being watched. And so I clicked on a trailer to just see what it was about. And it was like a two minute trailer just to kind of see with 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 the eyes of just finding out what is this and I will tell you I'm not a fearful person <laughs> I, and I know that these are movies and I'm aware of the demonic realm but as that trailer began to play I felt a spiritual force of of darkness flow through the computer and flow through the monitor into my office that was just absolutely palpable. And I had every hair on the back of my neck and on my arms standing up. I had this irrational terror just overwhelm me to the point where it was just, it was um, very frightening because it wasn't it wasn't the content, it was what, there was a palpable spiritual entity that was coming through that. I've experienced that before in the days I may have mentioned that uh, that I used to have a, uh, I, I had a, a demonic stronghold of pornography. And before I was set free and delivered from that, I could, I could feel the demonic pull as, when I would open the door to that, uh, to those kinds of things, looking at those things on the computer. And so I've seen that the demonic realm can infuse and come through and flow through technology. And I'm thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ that he set me free from those demonic spirits to be able to walk in freedom in that area of my life. Another little, just a simple example is I was talking to a friend and was talking to him and we had a great relationship. The connection on the phone is just fine. We're able to talk and have this great conversation. I began to talk to him about deliverance and going through, you know, the process of deliverance and, and what, what it's like to have the Lord Jesus Christ set you free from demonic oppression. And as soon as I started talking about that, he's like, Michael, hello, 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 because his connection was all staticky and he couldn't hear what I was saying. So we hung up, called him again, had some conversation. We're talking again. Everything's fine. I start talking to him about it again. It happens again, the same thing, exactly. And so at that point, I prayed against it in Jesus' name and it was fine. And we were able to continue our conversation. So those are just some anecdotal uh, stories, I guess, but my, my belief system is that the demonic realm can be infused into technology, especially if those that are operating it are of a, um, like we talked about, an unregenerated mindset. They reject God and they are actively engaging with entities from beyond the veil to be able to get their inspiration, which is where a lot of this has come from. We need to be careful. 
We need to, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be careful. I want to talk a little bit about nanotechnology now. And again, basically, this is bringing robotics, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, you know, all kind of together on a micro, micro, micro scale. You know, nanotechnology is, is at the molecular level basically atomic level. It's extremely, extremely, extremely small. The, uh, the, the scale that I've been told before is that, you know, one nanometer, basically, if you made that the size of a marble, or I'm sorry, yeah, a, a marble, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm probably, probably mess this up, but it was a scale of like a marble to the, to the whole globe of the earth is how small it is. It's, it's able to go so small that it can go into our bloodstream. Tiny robots and AI that can move in our bloodstream. Right now, they're touting this technology as being able to do good, and I'm sure there is good that comes from it. Monitoring our health, repairing damage to our cells, you know, seeking out cancer cells and destroying them. Um, you know, possibly in the future, upgrades of kinds and things like that, or coming in and, and being able to help with diseases and things like that. All sounds wonderful. But my question always comes into this as to what else can it be used for? Again, we know that it can be hacked. So if you take these nanobots, these nanoparticles into your body and, and all that, then those can be hacked. Those can be uh, manipulated from, from the outside because they're connected to the cloud. They're connected out of your body into um, other spheres that can be accessed. Obviously, tracking is, you know, you can be tracked and you can be surveilled from anywhere um, all the time. And, you know, if, if the right powers had be wanted to, I'm sure triggers could be um, flipped and, you know, you could be shut off. And so we just, you know, these are, these are things that are dangerous because once we accept them into our bodies, once, we, once they come in and we, we embrace these things, then um, you can't really get them out. They're in there. And it's the same agenda as we see in Genesis 6, to, to alter, fundamentally alter the genetic DNA, the, gen, the pure genetic line. That was the whole reason, as we talked about in one of the last sessions, for the flood, was because the DNA in humankind had become so corrupt, all flesh had become corrupt. And that is the enemy's agenda, is to be able to destroy the image of God as God designed it. You know, Satan remembers the dragon slayer prophecy, that 6,000 year old prophecy that I talked about uh, a while back, the dragon slayer prophecy from Genesis 3.15 that, you know, that Eve, the, that, that her seed would crush Satan's head and that he would crush her heel. But he remembers that. And so he's constantly been working over time, over the, the, the millennia to, be, to destroy the image uh, bearers of God. We see all of this blending of technology into the human sphere. We, we hear it called different things. The singularity is one of the names for it. Um, we, we, we're hearing a lot about brain and artificial intelligence uh, interfaces. Elon Musk is a big player in that realm with Neuralink. Ray Kurzweil and others um, are, are very active in this realm of, of creating essentially cyborgs having us be able to, you know, compete with the AI and the quantum computing by us becoming that, a blend of humanity and technology, having the nanobots in us, the, the real-time access to all knowledge. You know, think about, you know, having the access to the internet and all of the knowledge that's available at all times just through your brain, through your thoughts, to be able to control things with your thoughts, to have connectedness with, you know, like a hive mind of all the best minds or, or all the minds and be able to use them at the same time. It's, it's dizzying. The possibilities are dizzying. You know, medical uses of this, military applications. They're even, they're even talking about uploading your consciousness when you die to be able to put that in a new uh, biologic shell of some kind. So this, that's where this push is for immortality. And again, you know, if, you're, if, you're not, if you don't have a biblical worldview and you're, you don't believe that you're created by an infinite and holy and sovereign God, then, you know, it makes sense. It's not necessarily that the people that are behind these things are evil or demonic. It is that they are deceived and they don't have the spirit of God that basically um, directs their uh, loyalty and their understanding that we are a created being and that God created us a certain way and 
He doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> and so to change that and to put ourselves in the position of God to be able to change us into a different species or a different um, being, that is not from the heart of God. And I'm just, I, we say this because I want, to, I want us to, be, to look at this through the lens of this war and understand the risks. And everybody has to make up their own decision. But that's where it really comes down to that deep, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to pray about these things, to be able to look at what the Word says, to be able to, um, to see your life through the lens of Scripture and through that eternal mindset that our life here on earth is very short, but that our life in eternity is forever. And so not to make compromises in this life that will forfeit basically your eternity. We're going to see, and we're already seeing, that these technologies, they're gaining incremental acceptance. They're being rolled out little by little. The media is really working uh, hard, the mainstream media, to, to spin this in a positive way, to show all the positive benefits and all the attributes and all the ways that we should embrace all of this hook, line, and sinker and wholeheartedly. You know, we, we see articles on medical solutions and humanitarian um, benefits of all this. You know, we, we uh, see about the lives that could be saved and we hear, you know, about really, you know, really, um, you know, true stories about people that are being able to hear now that couldn't hear before, people that can now see that couldn't see before. And, and again, this is where this line becomes, you know, how much technology is, is okay and how much crosses a line into it's not okay. And that becomes a uh, why it's really, really important to seek the Lord about these things. We hear a lot, and even though it's not, a lot of it's not public, but, you know, the military aspect of this and this arms race, this new arms race, it's basically not nuclear warheads anymore. It's these super soldiers. And we're seeing uh, countries like China and Russia uh, basically moving forward quickly with enhancing the soldiers to be able to be better and stronger and faster and, you know, be able to operate on the battlefield with real-time technology and accessing, you know, all of the data that's available and being gathered by these artificial intelligence um, computers on the battlefield and to be able to utilize them in real time. And it's one of these things where it's proposed as well. Our enemy is doing it and they're not as regulated as us. And so if we don't do it, then we're going to get annihilated. And I, I, I get it. I hear that. But but for those soldiers, especially in the United States, you know, those of, of our soldiers or even, or I guess, any, any innocent soldier, if you're messing with their DNA, you're messing with their body, what will that ultimately look like for them spiritually? And, you know, at what cost are we doing this? There are all kinds of secret projects and patents and, and you know, stories of uh, the bones of the giants, the DNA of the giants being used in this way to scrape the DNA and to be able to use it and to experiment with it. No doubt to be able to implement some of these genetic traits that the Nephilim had into our military, into the soldiers. And that kind of speaks to, um, you know, some of the things that Nancy has seen. We, we hear about this, this DNA manipulation uh, program called CRISPR, that uh, there's, there will be all sorts of enhancements that are going to be coming down the pike, and it's going to be difficult for us to resist as people. There, we're going to see people taking these things that have um, then remarkable abilities that we as regular humans don't have right now. And so it's going to be difficult for the old man or the normal human to compete what could it could usher in a class war or, you know, this make regular humans potentially obsolete. And eventually, I don't know if laws and things like that could make some of this stuff mandatory. Um, you know, we're, we're speculating on where all this is heading, but I just want us to think about where it's going. Again, not just getting enamored with the technology and the abilities in this life, but to think about what it, that, what that means for our future. You know, unless we understand the spiritual implications of these things, they're going to be really hard to resist. You know, if we are just clumps of carbon-based cells that have evolved over millions of years, then why not? But if we are the creation of an infinite and sovereign God made specifically in His divine image, it makes a lot of difference. You know, and this fundamental question is the key, and it's virtually all, it's, it's all behind this push toward humanity 2.0.
<clears throat> you know, for those of us that do understand the, the implications and the, the, the value of our eternal soul, um, this is the real problem, is how to navigate these days. You know, if we ignore God and the spiritual implications, there are eternal consequences that come to, pl- come to play here. Um, you know, the, the non-compliance, if, if those of us that do not comply with some of these things, will be viewed as backward and combative and uninformed and even enemies of the culture. You know, Jesus, the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, is Jesus only came to save humans. Um, how far do we go with some of these genetic modifications, DNA manipulation, uh, hybridization, merging with technology? You know, how far do we go until we're no longer human? What, what is the line on that? We saw even you know, in Genesis 6 that it was kind of 50-50 at the beginning where you had a 50% angelic being and a 50% human. And that already was an abomination to the Lord. And we had then in future lines over the, that, that thousand years, we had Nephilim, which were half, half and half, then procreating and, and creating other beings that were less angelic and more human. So we saw the percentage, right, going down and down and down. And yet it, even at that point, it was so abominable to the Lord that he wiped out everyone. And so we're playing with fire when we begin to tamper with our DNA and tamper with what it makes us human. Because, you know, in, before the flood, it said all flesh had been corrupted. And at some point, will we be unable, those of us, you know, or those people that then embrace this technology and embrace the genetics and embrace all this stuff and, and push forward into the, the becoming humanity 2.0, will they be able to be redeemed? And that's an eternal question. That is quite a risk and quite a gamble. You know, we read in Matthew 24, 21, when he's talking about, you know, the coming uh, end times, it says, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive or no flesh would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And so, again, what is he talking about here? Is this, is this some of what he's talking about, that, that no flesh, you know, I don't know if he's talking about, you know, each day shorten or if he's talking about the time. And I think he's probably talking about the, the pace at which we're going as a culture and as a, the technology ramps forward, just exponentially growing. Will we come to a place where no flesh will be able to survive? You know, and so will that cause the Lord to cut short the days that we have and to bring judgment? You know, the question for people is, you know, would you sacrifice your eternal salvation and your life, your, your eternal life for some short-term enhancement, even as wonderful as it might be on this earth, or even a life extender? You know, if you, how valuable is your life compared to eternity? And we've got to maintain an eternal perspective on life, not temporal I'm not going to go a lot into this, but there, you know, another, another dynamic that's at work in our culture that I just am urging people to pay attention to is disclosure. And, uh, and I'm not going to go a lot into it, but we're seeing more and more and more conversations about UFOs and about, you know, the government acknowledging their existence. And we're seeing Navy photos and, you know, fighter pilots chasing these things and seeing the incredible things that they're doing, reported encounters and abductions and all this kind of stuff. You know, what are these entities? How do they fit into a Christian worldview? And with the Bible, I used to think that they were just masquerading demons, but there may be more to the story. And so, you know, they may be part of of this deception that's coming. I just would encourage you, I'm not going to go into it today, but I just would encourage that we as believers should should press in to understand and to look into these things to see how, how they fit, if they do fit, into the Christian worldview and how they jive with the Bible and with the Spirit of God and to pray through these things so that we're not caught unaware, that we're thinking, that we're not just accepting what is being put forth as the narrative um, by the media. You know, the, the coming days that we're going to be facing leading up to 
the, the end end times, the final you know, tribulation. The coming days as Satan and his Antichrist, are, as they prepare to be revealed, and as the Antichrist is revealed, we're going to be seeing modified humans. We're going to be seeing, they call them hubrids, so human and hybrids. We're, we'll see a return of the Nephilim. We'll see hybrid creatures. We'll see terrifying technology, all demonically infused and controlled. The tracking and surveillance capability will be staggering. Christians will be persecuted and hunted. Warfare will be unlike anything we've ever known. If we're not prepared, our hearts may fail for what is coming on the earth. You know, whether, even if the great tribulation is not imminent, and I don't know, you know, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen, the great tribulation. But we will, I do believe that we we will see imminent hard times. We will see imminent judgment, conflict, pers- persecution. It is already happening. You know, we, we see here this, this scripture that uh, I think Nancy read earlier about the, the coming times. You know, it says that, th- that in, the, in the end times, when the tribulation comes, there will be signs in the, in the sun and in the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I don't say all this to create fear because the remnant Christians, those of us that know our Lord, those of us that that are walking with Him, that have that deep, intimate connection with Him, we will see God move supernaturally on our behalf. You know, we will see. Jesus Jesus Himself says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will, not might, but you will have trouble. But take heart, I, Jesus, has overcome the world. And in Daniel uh, 11.32, it says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And so that's what we're going to see. I I don't want us to, you know, to go into fear over this. And we're going to be talking about how to prepare and how to toughen up and how to, you know, get our to gird up our loins spiritually and to be ready for whatever comes, to have that rock-solid faith that can withstand anything and that deep connectedness with the Lord to be able to get our real-time marching orders from our commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to I want to give have Nancy come back up and give another vision that the Lord has given her that really is encouraging as an example of the kind of thing that we're probably going to see in the coming days. And so, Nancy, if you would, come up and, and oh, share that. Certainly. Wow. That's all I can say is, wow, so well done. So as I was spending time uh, seeking Abba about this war that we're in and the battles that lie ahead, you know, we have several different people that in our life that they understand that these difficult days are coming and, and you can look around that, you know, we know, we acknowledge that they're on the horizon, but the response to that understanding is varied. And so, you know, some are very focused on the physical preparations. Some are very focused um, on armoring up, um, in, again, in that physical realm and building defensive locations and, you know, being very strategic in this, in this battle. And so I just set aside some time to ask Abba, what is it that you require of Michael and I? You know, what should we be doing in this time? It's a very reasonable question. And so Psalms 11 makes it very clear that our first line of defense is always, always, always to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And our lives are held in his hands and and we believe firmly that he will lead and guide us in each step of the way. Whether we live or whether we die, we're going to trust him. And I I wanna be very clear here that I, I do believe that there's wisdom And I believe that there is prudence also in that physical preparation. But our hope cannot lie in our abilities. That's not where our trust can be. Um, It cannot, we cannot be dependent on, you know, food stores and weapons and things that we can do in this physical realm to basically be victorious in this battle. We must be faithful to Abba first. We must put him first in all things and surrender to him in full obedience. The, The root of this war is spiritual 
and there's a deeply spiritual component to it. And I believe with all of my heart that every battle we face is one in the heavenlies on our knees before we ever see that victory here manifest in, in this earth. So as I was seeking him and asking him, what do you require of me? Um, he gave me this vision. And again, that's just the way that he's always has, always has spoke to me. And, and so what I, what I saw is I was in this house and um, I, it was like the ground was vibrating and I really thought that there might be an earthquake, which was unusual. Wherever this house was, that was not common to where we were. And so I went out into the front yard and saw that my neighbors too were also in their front yards and we were trying to figure out what this was. Well, the next door neighbor immediately to um, adjacent to this home comes running out and he's like, have you seen my wife? Have you seen my wife? And I'm like, no, I haven't seen her. And he said, well, she went to visit family members and she's not back. And he was, he was really worried. And this sound, again, that was just vibrating the ground had everybody really, really edgy. And so I didn't, um, none of us knew what the source of this was. But pretty soon, um, the people started running down our street and in just the looks on their face, they were just terrified. They were obviously fleeing something and they, the, the, they were just beyond, out of their mind in fear. They couldn't form a cohesive sentence. They, they were just saying, they're coming, get out of the way. They're coming, get out. Don't go into your house, get out of the way. And, and just, you know, it was chaos just ensued and people were grabbing their children and, and fleeing, even though we had no idea what it was that was coming. And of course, again, my neighbor, my elderly neighbor is just beside himself in fear for his wife. And in this chaos, his, his wife found um, her way to him and she was just undone. And she was screaming and crying and she's like, you know, there, there is an army coming and it's hideous and, and they're killing all the people and they're, nobody can survive this and we have got to get out of here. And she's trying to pull on her husband and he, he's, you know, we're all just trying to comprehend what is going on here. And then I realized that the vibration in the ground had a cadence to it. It was, um, and what it was is it was the stomping of this, the feet of this progressive army that was quickly coming into this neighborhood and it was shaking the whole ground. And I thought, what in the world could that be that it's shaking literally the earth? And so um, as we're standing there, we could look down the road and we began to see that these creatures, and I say creatures because they were in physical form, but they were, no two were the same. And again, I saw that the, you know, some mixed with animals, some mixed um, with humans, varying size, varying facial features, um, just incredibly difficult to look at because they were nothing that we have seen in this life, none of us. And so there, we're watching them go into these houses and hearing, you know, the screams of the people in the homes that had tried to hide. And, and it was, it was bloodthirsty. You know, there, it was gory. It was violent. It was just, um, they were, they were sent on it. It was a death march. They were, they were wiping out everything that was in their path. And so obviously there's, you know, there's a concern there of what do you do? But even the people that were running and fleeing were not able to get out of their path because some of these were taller than the houses themselves. And so it was literally just, uh, you know, everybody who was running was getting snatched and killed. And so I grabbed my neighbors and I brought them into my house. And, you know, the way that visions unfold, they're not always in, in our time. But the next thing I knew, several other people who evidently we had talked about this before because they, they all came to my home and it's like everybody just shifted into this mode of knowing exactly what they were supposed to do. There was um, one woman who had taken all the children and they'd gone into one of the back bedrooms. Um, in the house itself, there, you know, was fortification in the house. There were physical weapons in the house. There was food that was stored. And, but like I said, everybody just kind of shifted into these roles of what they knew they were supposed to do. 
Someone took the kids. Someone was, you know, bringing, you know, getting water. Someone was bringing out weapons. I mean, we all had stations where we knew. And I was at the at the front of the house looking out to this window. And on all of the windows, it was like metal plates had been had been fixed and put in place. And so it was quite a fortress. And um, and I was with other people that were also armed and we were basically waiting for the time that they would come to this home. And in that, you know, that chaos um, within this home, there was this peace that just settled and it, it prevailed on everybody that was there. We were all, you know, in one accord, we all, you know, had yielded our lives to Abba's will. We um, all were believers, and um, I heard from one of the back rooms the children. This always brings tears to my eyes, and they were singing. They were worshiping the Lord, and they were just they were just singing praises to Him in the midst of this chaos. And I can remember just listening to their to their sweet sweet worship. And everybody who was in out um, on that front line with me, we're, we were just praying. We were calling on God, and we were basically saying, you know, we are going to trust you, and whether we live or whether we die, we will stand in the in the beloved name of our Savior Jesus Christ. We will not be moved, and we will trust you. Our life is in your hands, and we were just praying, and interceding. And we are armed and we are ready to engage in battle. But, you know, the two were not in conflict of each other. They were actually in um, harmony together. And so as I'm looking out, um, you know, it was our house that was next. And I watched these entities. They were, you know, going down the street and going down the sidewalk. And, and we're just praying. We're ready to fight, but we're also prepared to die. And we knew where our eternal souls were going. Nobody that was there feared death. It was, we knew that, you know, whether we live or die, Jesus' name is going to be on our lips. And so it was very interesting because the children are singing, we're praying, we're, we're ready for a battle. But as they came in, they were standing in front of the house. It's like they took a little break. Um, and they were covered in blood. They were, you know, armed for battle. And then it was time. And so what happened was uh, they sent their first wave of maybe four or five of these, these creatures. Again, some of them were, I would say, 10 to 12 feet tall because they were taller than the door into my home. Some were smaller, all different um, None, like I said, none, none of them looked the same. They were all very different, very mixed. And so as they stepped foot onto what would be the, the yard, about two or three steps in, they were about halfway into the yard, all of a sudden they just dropped to their, their knees and they're screaming in agony and, and almost like a convulsion, you know, and they're on the ground. And I couldn't really tell what was happening, but it looked like every once in a while you could see almost like an electrical current that was um, from the grass into their bodies and it was like jolting them. And so this, the second wave behind them, you know, were cursing at them and, you know, basically making fun of them. And, and so they came onto the lawn. And when they came onto the lawn, the same thing happened. They were just laid out. And so they couldn't hold their weapons. They couldn't move. They were, it was like immobilized. And we just started praying louder, out loud, and just asking, you know, warring angels to come and to defend us and to fight on our behalf. And this enemy is too strong for us but he is not too strong for you. And, and as we were praying, they basically were trying to inch their way back off of the grass to get back off the sidewalk, to get away from whatever this was that was happening to them. And they did. They inched their way back. Their weapons stayed in the yard. They inched their way back. And once they got off of the grass and out of, you know, the domain of this house, which we had set up, you know, a spiritual fortification around this home, a hedge of protection. Abba, we consecrate this place to you. You reign here. This is, this is where your people dwell. So therefore, this is a temple of the living God and nothing that is not of your Holy Spirit is allowed to enter here, is allowed to step foot on this property. 
great. So once they got outside of that, that hedge that we had established, you know, they were shaking themselves off. They had no idea what was happening, but it was severe enough that not one of them tried again. And they literally just, you know, were, were dazed, they were puzzled, they were angry, they were you know cursing, they were trying to save face with each other, and basically they moved on. And they, they left us alone, and we just all fell on our face, just worshiping the Lord and just praising Him, because we knew that day that um, the battle was won by the hand of our living God, that it had nothing to do with any of us that was in there. Um, just like it says in Psalms 91, you know, the enemy was not able to come near our dwelling. Again, we were prepared to fight and we were prepared to die. But this was a supernatural intervention in answer to our cries from our holy and our righteous Father. And the enemy had to flee. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> That's powerful. You know, it, it even reminds me of uh, of a vision similar, or, or another vision that I had heard from uh, Henry Gruber, very, very powerful uh, man of God who's now passed, but uh, prayer walker, you know, throughout the world. And he, he had a vision from the Lord of, of invading troops and, and bands of believers that were, you know, at different places in their path and literally even unbeknownst to the troops, they would split and go around these groups and keep going and reform and just miss these um, pockets of believers. So, you know, and, and we're going to talk more about that as we as we come up. But, but the Lord, you know, our Lord is is more than able. We have no reason to fear. Again, in our own strength, in our own strength for what we're going to face, uh, we have no hope. But those of us that uh, accept the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why I would, I, I cannot, the one decision that I would urge above all decisions of anyone that's watching this, this video, if you've not put your trust and your, your hope and your life in, in the hands of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed that you're a sinner, that you need him as your savior and that you're surrendering your, surrendering your life to him to come in and be your Lord and master, not just your savior, but to run your life from here on out and, and, and surrendering and confessing him as your Lord and asking him to come in and the Holy Spirit will come into your heart. That is the one and only true defense against all things that will be coming against us. And that's the beauty is that even if we lose our life in this realm, that we have all of eternity in heaven with, with him, you know, there's, there's no reason to give into fear. You know, we are, to, we are commanded over and over in scripture to be strong and courageous, you know, to not give in to fear, to press in to the Lord, to, to know him, to really know him and to be known by him. That's one of the things in you know, Matthew 7 that's always a scary passage when he says to, to some you know, that called him Lord, Lord, he said, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. you know, get away from me, you that practiced iniquity. And that, that, that idea of knowing is a very intimate, that's a very intimate, like a husband and wife intimacy, um, becoming an expert, as Nancy has said before, on that. You know, are, do we really know him? And does he really know us in that deep, intimate way? That's, that is the single biggest uh, preparation that we can make for the days that are coming. Knowing him, knowing his word, really knowing his word, not just relying on a pastor or someone to teach it, you know, uh, but, but you, for each one of us to read the word ourselves, to know it, to, to feed on it, just like we would feed on daily bread, like we would feed on our, uh, our food is to, is to, to feed on the word daily, to know it, to, to obey it and let it change us, you know, that we don't come to the word to change it and to make it conform to what we want. We, the word is, is eternal. And it is the inerrant word of God. And so to come and let it, let it change us, to come with a heart of, Lord, if I come across something that offends me or has come across something that challenges me, you know, I'm going to acknowledge that you're right and I'm wrong. And there may be, there may be areas that, that we each need to study and learn. And as we've, as Nancy, the journey and I, that we have gone on, we're constantly learning. And, but, but to come to with a heart of surrender to him and that he will meet you. He will, he will meet us. He will protect us. He will strengthen us. You know, he will never leave us or forsake us, he says. And as a born again believer, even if we are to lose our earthly life, we get to go and be with Jesus forever. You know, it's a win. 
But to live in, is Christ and to die is gain. You know, don't compromise. I just, I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they're called to, to just, you know, just bow down, you know, to the king and just, just bow down to this statue. And everybody else is doing it. Just, you know, just go along. God knows your heart. You know, you don't have to really mean the words or whatever, you know. But they said, <laughs> they said, we won't. They said, our God is able to save us from this fire that the, this fiery furnace that they were going to be thrown into. Our God is able and he will save us. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't and we lose our life, we will not bow down and compromise and serve anyone other than Yahweh Elohim, the great and mighty I am. You know, and we know the story is that God met them in the fire. He didn't pull them out of the fire. He led them and, and sustained them through the fire. And so that may be an apt metaphor, you know, and a picture for us to grasp onto in the coming days. Again, whatever the days may hold, but to, to decide now in our heart of hearts, decide now who you'll serve. You know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But decide now and, and anchor to him and press into him with everything that you have so that when that fire comes, as trials come, instead of burning up wood and hay and stubble, it'll refine you as precious, precious gold and silver. So we're going to stop there for this session. We're going to come back to the next session. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you.